Welcome to Ideas in Action, a television series about ideas and their consequences. I'm Jim Glassman. The topic this week is America suffering an innovation gap. Once the world's leader in developing new products, the U.S. is losing ground to other countries, at least according to a recent report by the U.S. Department of Commerce. In an era of global competition, what are the consequences if American innovation stalls? Joining me to explore this topic, Michael Mandel, former chief economist for Business Week magazine and founder of Visible Economy, a new venture combining business and economic journalism with educational videos. Robert Atkinson, president of the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, a DC-based technology policy think tank. And Cheryl Schwartz, chief operating officer of Blue Canopy Consulting, a firm specializing in information security and technology integration, and a member of the Northern Virginia Technology Council. The topic this week, what should be done about America's innovation gap? This is Ideas in Action. Funding for Ideas in Action is provided by Investors Business Daily. Every stock market cycle is led by America's never-ending stream of innovative new companies and inventions. Investors Business Daily helps investors find these new leaders as they emerge. More information is available at Investors.com. America's leadership in developing new products has long been a source of pride, but some say the U.S. is now falling short. Although new high-tech gadgets appear almost daily, some experts argue that these seemingly new products are based on technologies that are already dated and that fundamental breakthroughs will require a new push for innovation. Commerce Department data show technological innovation is linked to 75% of the nation's economic growth after World War II. But now, the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation ranks the U.S. in sixth place overall behind Singapore, South Korea, and Luxembourg, and last in progress toward new knowledge-based innovation over the last decade. What can reignite the drive towards cutting-edge technologies that not only transform lives, but create demand and move our economy forward? Mike Mandel, you talk about an innovation drought in the United States. What do you mean by that? Well, we've learned to think about the U.S. as a very innovative uh, uh, country, people, as you say, talk about the iPhone, talk about Google, they sort of said, oh, of course we're innovative. But if you look across the entire range of things, life sciences, speech technology, artificial organs, all the things that were, if, we, if you run back 10 years, that were supposed to happen, we were supposed to have amazing advances that, that we fell short on. So communications, we've been great. Life sciences has been a disaster. Physical sciences, we haven't put money into. So in area after area, we have fallen short. An innovation shortfall, an innovation drought. When we say life sciences, you mean biology, that sort of thing? I mean, we are developing new drugs. Oh, we're developing very few of them, and they're incremental. Compared to what was expected, gene therapies, there's no commercially available gene therapies at this point. Uh, you know, cancer treatments, fallen way short of what was expected. Biotech was supposed to lead to a stream of cutting edge new drugs. Instead, we have pharma companies who have had to merge because their drug pipelines have dried up. We're gonna look back on this period as being a disaster in the life sciences, not on the science, but in the, uh, the actual products. Rob, your organization ranks the U.S. sixth overall, I'm going to get this straight, in innovation and competitiveness compared to other countries. How did you reach that uh, ranking? Well, in a report we issued last year called the Atlantic Century, we looked at um, the U.S. and 39 other nations, and we looked at a number of different variables that are related to the process of innovation. So things like uh, how much corporate R&D is invested every year as a share of GDP how much private R&D, how much venture capital, how many new startups, uh, uh, how, much, uh, uh, how many scientists and engineers are in a country. 
And the common wisdom, including in many of, much of the press, is that the U.S. is the world leader in innovation. But that's really equivalent to looking at a star and saying that it hasn't, it hasn't turned supernova yet because we're not seeing it. We're, what we're really doing is we're looking in the rearview mirror. The U.S. used to be the leader, but now we're not. We're sixth out of these 40 countries. And as you said earlier, what's really most disturbing and most surprising to us when we did this study, we were dead last in progress. So Yeah, 40th in innovative progress. And so what does that mean? In other words, we, we may be sixth in where we are now, but we're not moving quickly enough? Well, actually, when we, if we, when we went back and did the study, when we did the study, we looked at where the U.S. was in 2000 and where they are today, where we are today. In 2000, we were so far above it. We were number one in 2000, but not just by a little bit, by a lot. So the closest country to us in 2000 was Sweden, and they were 10 percentage points below us in an overall ranking of zero to 100. Now we've fallen to sixth. Uh, Sweden's ahead of us, a number of other countries. And the reason is that in, on all of these variables, the growth of corporate R&D, the growth of government R&D, the growth of venture capital, we have been slower in most of those variables than these other countries. So you put all this together, and we just haven't made the inputs, uh, the progress that these other countries have made. And so the long-term implications of this 40th ranking are pretty scary. Well, they're really scary because Historically, the U.S. has led the world in per capita income and, 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 and uh, the economy because we've been the most innovative country in the world. And this is even more important today because now we're competing against a whole slew of countries that can outcompete us on cost by far. We have to be able to compete on innovation and the next new thing. And if we can't do that, if we're having trouble, it's going to mean that we're not going to have the kind of good quality jobs that we need. Cheryl, as an, an on-the-ground innovator, do you think that government can help businesses innovate more or should it just get out of the way? Well, first of all, I think that the reality is from an innovation perspective, we actually see quite a bit of innovation and I think it depends upon how you define what innovation is. There's a very broad spectrum of innovation, everything from breakthrough science and discovery all the way through incremental engineering and process improvements for productivity. I think that in a lot of ways we kind of forget that and what we're seeing now is we're kind of at the cusp of what I call the social networking world meets the business collaboration platform meets these innovation networks. And what's happening is there's scientists, there's entrepreneurs, there's thought leaders from all over the world that are now joining on these innovative platforms and are able to share ideas and solve problems. P&G is a perfect example of that. Procter & Gamble has an innovation network that now over 50% of their products are coming out of this innovation network. Let, let, me, let me understand what that means. I mean, I understand how the technology makes it easier mm -hmm. for people to communicate mm -hmm. and share their ideas, but when you say Procter & Gamble has an innovation network, yes. what does that exactly they mean? They have designed this thing called Connect and Develop, which basically reaches out to thousands of people all over the world scientists, thought leaders, and so forth to help collaborate and share and ideas and how to solve problems. So they put, salt, they put ideas out there, they put problems out there, and those people then work together because you now are dropping these political barriers and borders, and people are working now as one to try and solve these problems. And are, are these employees, or I mean, wh nope, why do they share the information? They're insiders and outsiders. I think that what you find, I think the statistics I've read is, Probably 85% of the people now in the Generation X and Generation Y are interested in actually solving problems to improve humanity. See, this is, a, this is the part I don't understand, uh, Mike. Why is it that we're falling behind in innovation in the United States? At the same time, uh, the sharing of information is so much easier, uh, and you know, computers can try things out that you don't even have it's to very try good, it's out. A very in real good life. question. The theory was that global sharing, okay, mm -hmm. was going to accelerate innovation. Okay? In communications, it has social networks, but if you look, at, you, you have to go and you have to look area by area, okay? So for example, if you look at the development of, say, gene therapies, okay, or cancer drugs, or diabetes drugs, you look at, we've spent in the US, we've actually spent, uh, uh, the most money on, in life sciences. We haven't spent a lot of money on other things. If you look, you sort of see it's all fallen short. If you look at P&G, you see that actually there's been incremental innovation, but the breakthrough innovations that actually produce the growth, the real growth, haven't been there. Now, it could turn out to be true that these 
global net innovation networks start producing better than they have. But I can tell you that if you actually look at what has been come out of them, the, uh, the sense of disappointment is, is palpable. So for example, it may be that you have better products for cleaning your home. Mm -hmm. It's solving a problem, okay? But that's not actually what drives growth. And uh, it's, it's the big ideas, it's the big ideas that create jobs. Okay, so, so Rob, how, why are we failing? to develop these big ideas? Is it, I don't know, lack of basic research? Or what's going on? Well, look, go back to this notion of what other people would also call open innovation. That's another term for right, this right. In innovation network. One, one way to look at open innovation, which uh, most people don't look at, is why are companies going to open innovation? Partly it's because they can, because of the internet and other things, and it's useful. But one of the reasons is because they're simply not doing it on their own anymore. So everybody's looking outside to pick that up. Cheaply. 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 Because they're not doing it anymore on their own. So you look at basic research by U.S. corporations has significantly declined over the last 15 years. Even applied research has declined. And so what companies are trying to do is, and the reason it's declined, Jim, is because the market is so competitive. Companies can't afford to do that kind of work because it's what economists call it spills over. It benefits everybody. So there's a collective goods problem or a collective action problem and companies are not able to solve it on their own. So that's one of the reasons why. You go to look at other countries, you use an example, the R&D tax credit was, designed, was developed, the US was the first country in the world to develop the research and development tax credit for companies. And in the late uh, 80s, early 90s, we had the most generous research and development tax credit in the world, by far. Now we're a 17th out of the 30 OECD countries in research and development tax credit. The French now have a research and development tax credit four times more generous than the United States does. And so that's one factor. Uh, government cutbacks in research are another factor. There are a whole set of things that, that are a part of this problem. Can I just add one thing? What the U.S. has done over the last 10 years is specialize in life sciences and healthcare research. 70% of the academic spending on R&D goes for life sciences. As opposed to physical sciences. As opposed to physical sciences, as opposed to environmental sciences. Right. In a world in which people talk green all the time, the U.S. is actually increasing the share of our spending that goes to life sciences. We're not putting it into environment, the so-called green jobs of the future. We're not putting it into the physical sciences, which, which is what would underlie the information technology mm -hmm breakthroughs, okay, we put this massive bet on the life sciences. The government, if you look at the share of government spending. And you're saying that even though there's a massive bet, it hasn't paid off. It hasn't paid off. And if you think about it, this is, we, well, it goes along with our health care spending. We put a lot of money into health care. We put a lot of money into life sciences. And unfortunately, the pharma companies, which have been at the leading edge of this, uh, part of that, they, they have been cutting R&D personnel either because they've been cutting it or because they haven't been paying off. Uh, Cheryl, what about the, let, let me add another problem. Credit what about the credit markets? Sure, access uh, to capital is a huge right, issue. Access to capital, either through credit or equity. It, and has that become a big problem, especially in recent years for recent startup years. businesses it's or for R&D? It's a problem for small for business and it's also part, it's a problem in large businesses for different reasons. Wall Street does not actually reward innovation. They never have because of their tactical nature. Um, they, in other words, innovation costs something in the short term, correct. and so it hurts your earnings. Yes, and the, re re the reward, they do reward you after the, after the fact. They don't reward you before the fact. I think small businesses, access to capital is a huge issue. You know, I actually have talked about and been a big proponent of tax credits for investments in new technology and innovation. And I think that's really, really important to set bold goals. You have a generation of people who want to do what you're talking about, they who want, to, want to, social responsibility is a new season of, of innovation. But I think on your innovation point that I think is really important, why we innovate to create jobs. And we innovate so that we can create sustainability and for economic advantage, right? And the reality is I think the United States can't survive on innovation alone. And I think what's happening is the building blocks are being outsourced. And what the government can do is try and get those outsourcings back into the United States. So we start building the components. And I think with this next new wave of innovation, it is critical that in healthcare, energy, and those things, we are not outsourcing the R&D, because which that is what's happening now. More of the R&D is getting outsourced, which is painful. And I think that the life cycle of innovation needs to come here. What does that mean, it's, it's being outsourced? You mean that a big American company will 
put its research facility somewhere else. Correct. But it still benefits the American company. It does, but what's happening is the IT building blocks and the engineering building blocks for building that technology does tend to go overseas and not, it's not happening uh, let, here. Let, let, let me bring Rob in here. Um, so if there are limited resources, that's one of the problems here, do you think the government should make decisions about, say, picking winners, concentrating on certain industries? Yeah, here's what we want to do. We want to pick winners in generalized technology areas. We don't want to pick particular firms, and we don't want to pick particular narrow technology. So it's pretty clear that battery technology is going to be future, uh, critical to our future. We have to get a good electric batteries for cars and things like that. But we don't want, the government shouldn't be going, well, this is this kind of lithium is the better than, than, than the nano. But that's one of these promises that Mike was talking about. There's been a lot of money invested in, in finding no, actually, there uh, hasn't, battery there technology. Actually, there hasn't been. No? No. What's fascinating here about kind of what you say is that probably the most important thing that the government can do is actually just make it clear that innovation is important. So we as a country have not done this. If you look, if you look... But how do, how do you do that? Is that just uh, something that the president should get out and say, uh, uh, or, or is well, it tax credits, think about or it what this is way. it? What's the thing that can slow innovation down the most? Bureaucracies. Bureaucracies are the friend of the status quo and the enemy of the new. And really, what we have, what you need the first, the signal from the top, that innovation is a good thing. That's the most important thing. Then some of the things like the R&D tax credit, which are not that much money, are, are easier to get through. Okay? You need to make it clear that we are in favor. When, when Obama talks about innovation these days, this is the way his speech is run. We like innovation. What we really like is green innovation. And those green innovation, we'll talk about in, job, jobs for people doing insulation. So it quickly goes from, three sentences goes from innovation to... So what should so he say? What he should say is that we care about innovation. We care. It's important to have new things, okay? And, and the first thing we're going to propose, not because it's necessarily a lot of money, go ahead and sort of do the R&D track credit or something that is, put it up at the top of the agenda. So is there anything more? We keep talking about the R&D tax yeah, credit. So anything? And that may not happen because there's a lot of concern about taxes in general but I think setting and goal, revenues I, and setting bold budget I deficits. I think setting bold goals for innovation is absolutely important for the what government What about education? Too. Education, for education, health, energy, and environment, we need to set bold goals. You have a generation of people coming up that that is what they want to do. But isn't that part of the problem in the United States that there has been a decline in the quality of science and technology well, education. It's not so much the decline in the quality is in the, just the pure numbers. We need to focus much more laser-like on what's called STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and math. Here in Washington, we're really, uh, we're really blessed to have uh, one of the best high science high schools in the country, Thomas Jefferson. Uh, it's a science magnet high school that cranks out kids who are really dedicated and passionate and go on. But we only have 100 of these science high schools in the country. We should have 500. We should have 1,000. What, what about what business can do? Are, are, are American businesses becoming more risk-averse? Well, they weren't risk-averse. If, if I think about uh, companies like Intel, they've put out a lot of money. Boeing has put out a lot of money. The pharma companies put out a lot of money. They put the money in. Right? And the reason why they became more risk-averse is because it failed. It wasn't because the Wall Street stopped them. I mean, it turns out that innovation is just a very risky business. So here we have a situation where innovation is risky business. The U.S. has hooked itself economically in the global division of labor as innovation. It's something that we as a country have to get behind as a, as a country. And I'm less concerned about the picking winners and losers. Well, really, I think that's paradox kind of here. You say, on the one hand, the United States has, 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 has essentially decided that innovation is our comparative advantage, yes, but then we, we talk, haven't gotten behind it we enough. Talk, we talk about it as if we, we behave as if it's our comparative advantage. We sort of allow the factories to go well, overseas. But one of the reasons why innovation is so hard. And that's because in the U.S., if you develop an innovative product, the odds of it being stolen the intellectual property being stolen and expropriated from you with no rights taken by China, by India, by Brazil, by Russia is very, very high. And we do very little to protect U.S. companies on their intellectual property. So they know that the risks are very high for them to lose that and they in innovate less because of it. How big a problem is that, Cheryl, for the, with the companies that you know? 
I think do people that, say, well, I'm not going to innovate because it's going to get stolen. I'll yeah, go do I don't something think else. that isn't something. I think the cyber in the cyber arena, I mean, certainly being on the defensive is something that we we need to work on. But I think that in terms of, you know, people being afraid, I think on the government side, the government wants innovation, to your point. However, they want a proven they want a proven solution. So, I mean, that's that kind point. of that's that kind of puts it in a nutshell. So, I because think because innovation because the nature of innovation is it's risky. You don't know what the future is. Right. There are they pockets want, of innovation. That's why actually DARPA, they, they, they want they want innovation as long as it's not risky. Well, I, I want to go back to something you said. <laughs> the very first thing you said, Mike, um, which troubled me a little bit. You said it was supposed to be this, it was supposed to be that, and they, it didn't develop. But, I mean, we don't know what if innovation go, is going to bring us. If you go back to 98, and if you go back to what people were investing money in, venture capitalists, corporations, large sums of money, none of these, none of these uh, entities had time frames longer than five years, maybe seven years. Okay? There were vast sums of money invested in things like micro-machines, vast sums of money invested in things like speech technology. There were vast sums of money invested in low orbit Earth satellites to provide broadband everywhere. Right? You remember that. I do. There were large sums of money invested in gene therapy uh, trials. Okay? You go down the list and you look, we're not talking about pie in the sky stuff. We're talking about where we as a country have put down our markers, not in the our, not in the research, not in the basic research, by by by, by organizations who expected to get a return in the five to ten year time frame and did not get it. I'm going by the market. Where the market put its money. So the market fell. The market, this way. the market so fell. The market, the market put billions of dollars, okay, into biotech related stuff, hundreds of billions of dollars, and I'm not exaggerating here. Okay. And with and in terms of the ten, what with a less than 10 year time frame, and things just here's the here's the most optimistic way of putting it. Okay. Things just took longer than we thought. So, but there are areas where the United States still excels, right? Mm -hmm. Sure. And where, where are they? Well, we excel in, um, for example, in commercial aviation. We'd excel even more if it wasn't for uh, Airbus and getting vast, uh, just pure subsidies from the government to support Airbus. Boeing is the world leading company in jet aircraft. We excel in- And yet we haven't really seen any spectacularly different jet aircraft, I think, in the last, I don't know, 50 years no, I or think so. the 7, uh, what is it, the 787, 787? that's a, the, the fully, first fully composite aircraft. To fly by wire was relatively new. So, you know, if you want to say, have, can, can we get to what they were planning to do, the low orbit jet to get to Japan, that's not something that a company's going to invest in by themselves. Just like this, you just stop right there. That's just really important, okay? Because- because Boeing has been making incremental innovations, but they have not fundamentally changed the economics of air travel, which is part of what the airline's problems are. They want new jets because they can get a 15% gain in, in, in fuel efficiency on it, but 15% is not an enormous amount. That's not enough to drive economic right. growth. Right, I mean, I'm we've heard, for example, the, uh, the idea of air taxi service. In other words, you know, we, we still have planes doing exactly what they did 50 years ago, flying yeah. from one big airport to another big airport with 100 people on Be, them or 200 people on them. Because we can't get the technology working to do the air traffic control. But where does, where does innovation come from? Doesn't it actually come from the bottom up? Isn't, isn't this something that the government finds a hard, hard time doing or big companies find a hard time doing? No, I think it's an unmet need. It's an unimagined need. It's a need that people really feel is out there. There's a pain point or there's a pain point. Um, that's what really, I think, gets innovation going. Um, pain point meeting, you just, you, yeah, there, it's too difficult to do. It's too, too difficult. Like, you know, our dependency on oil would be an example. We need to figure out a way to get out of that. I mean, those are the kinds of things that, you know, well, we should to, be thinking about. I guess to go to your point, where does innovation come from? It really, there's two sort of theories in, in, in the literature, and what Cheryl just talked about is technology pull. There's also technology push. Mm -hmm. And I would argue that a lot of our innovation comes from technology push. It comes from just inventions that emerge that spur innovation. So, for example, the ability to, of Intel to keep, or AMD or other companies to keep driving down microprocessing prices in, and, and storage and just creates all this innovation. So a, a good example of that would be, um, in Mike's point about biotechnology, I'm less pessimistic than Mike is about the life sciences because I think this is just a tough nut to solve. That's, that's, I'm hoping you're right. But, but one of the new technologies... No, technology, you might be right. right. I can't tell. But there, there are amazing new technologies out there, like companies like Life Technologies out of San Diego. They're developing the ability to do these, these analysis of genes at, 
at, at an unbelievably fast rate at an unbelievably low price. And that's just emerged in the last five years. So I think these platform technologies are very Let important. Let me just ask, Mike, the last question. What do you think is the most important thing to do to boost innovation? One thing. At this point, I would sort of say making sure that the government is not on board financially, but on board in terms of message, setting that this is, uh, that this is you know, financial reform, health care reform. Where is innovation in this package of things? Okay, that's really, I think, I think making sure that everybody knows that this is the way that the U.S. is going gonna, is gonna, to uh, thrive, okay? And whether it's in energy or life sciences or any other area, that's what we have to do. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Thank you Rob. Thank you. And that's it for this edition of Ideas in Action. Don't forget, you can take this show on the road by downloading it on your MP3 player through iTunes. That's an innovation. Or check out our website, www.ideasinactiontv.com. Thanks for joining us for Ideas in Action. I'm Jim Glassman. For more information, visit us at ideasinactiontv.com. Funding for Ideas in Action is provided by Investor's Business Daily. Every stock market cycle is led by America's never-ending stream of innovative new companies and inventions. Investor's Business Daily helps investors find these new leaders as they emerge. More information is available at investors.com. This program is a production of Grace Creek Media and the George W. Bush Institute, which are solely responsible for its content.